And welcome to our community. Susie Thomas here with you this morning. Uh, every once in a while, it is just very fun to pinpoint a very interesting person in our community. We've got a composer that lives here in Northeast Ohio, Dr. Jesse Ayers, who is, a, are you chair of the Department of no, no, Fine Arts? No. You got out of that, huh? Okay, but yes. teaching um, music and composition at Malone University in Canton. And welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, it is uh, wonderful having Having you. You are always doing such interesting things, and it seemed like when I was doing PR over there, I was constantly writing one news release after another because you were always winning another award. That hasn't stopped. So, Jesse, tell us a little bit about this most recent uh, amazing uh, award that you've been bestowed. Um, this was from Opera Kansas, which is an opera company in Wichita, and they had a contest for their 30th anniversary. And it was called the 30th Anniversary Zipic Modern Opera Contest. And this was an open call for scores, composers from around the United States and from around the world. They had several foreign countries enter. Um, and then the guidelines they wanted, um, this is an opera company that's very focused on taking opera to people instead of waiting for the people to come to them. And mm. they do a lot of concerts in schools and nursing homes, different venues. And so they wanted a one act, something, you know, within 30 minutes or less. Um, Something with a small cast, something with a simple set that's easy to take somewhere. And, uh, uh, and they wanted something that would fit in with a school's core curriculum that has an educational component. And I had just recently finished a piece that really met all those guidelines that dealt with American history. And so I sent that in, and I was fortunate enough to have won the contest. So um, just a couple of weeks ago now, uh, my wife and I were out in Wichita yeah. to hear them perform it. So cool. How interesting. How many people can say, oh, I happen to have an opera just like that in my back pocket ready to throw in. You were not writing this for a competition. You were writing this opera for what reason? Well, this was a commissioned work from last year um, from a, um, a group at Indiana Wesleyan University called Soprani Compagni. Uh, which roughly trans me translated means soprano companions. Mm -hmm. It's a soprano duet and piano. Um, and in March of 2015, they initiated a project to commission 12 composers, award-winning composers from across the U.S. and Korea. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those chosen to be among those. But they commissioned uh, these composers for the purpose of creating new repertoire for soprano duet. Now, the impetus of this project was twofold, and I find it really interesting. First, there was not a lot of literature for soprano duet when you compare it to the vast literature for so solo soprano. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm. second, and I will actually quote from their project description that they sent me, soprano repertoire often depicts limited portrayals of women themed around love for her man, external beauty, and unfulfilled dreams. Their vision was to have created for them new soprano duet literature that emphasized the contributions women have made to our culture and our society and women who have embraced their true value and calling mm -hmm. and have dared to change their world. So they explained that project to me and asked if I would like to be a part of that, and I very quickly said, yes, I would. It's very interesting to me, I think, that uh, especially with the Wichita, Kansas contest, that it was to be about, uh, to be a modern opera. And you wrote a modern opera, a 21st century opera, about 19th century women. I find that fascinating. And how did you come upon that story? Well, that's a story in and of itself. I was a little baffled what to write about, not because there aren't plenty of women that have made significant contributions, but because to find a story that lends itself to be told through the voices of two women and that can be told in the framework of 30 minutes. And that's a challenge. Um, and so as I was thinking this over, and my wife knew about the project, she came to me. She said, you know, I remember a story I've heard somewhere. Let me do a little Googling. So, um, so then she came back and said, here, read this. And it's an absolutely fascinating story about two women during the American Civil War. They live in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. Um, one was Elizabeth Van Lu. She was the daughter of a very wealthy hardware merchant mm -hmm. who had owned slaves. And when he passed away, Elizabeth is a staunch abolitionist, and she set her slaves free. 
Not only that, but she took her personal fortune that she inherited from her father, and she spent almost all of it in buying back members of the slaves' families that had been sold off. So she wow. set her slaves free, spent all her money to buy back these others to buy them their freedom. So this is a woman who put her money where her mouth was. Yes. She was also a firebrand, very daring. Uh, initially, she convinced people that the Southern women of Richmond needed to show how merciful they were by visiting prisoners in the, the Union soldiers in the uh, Union prison camp, I mean, the Confederate prison camps holding the Union soldiers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she was doing it to get information. So I don't know how she transmitted all this information, but she had a coding system where she would bring them books to read along with things that they might need. And then they had a system of underlining certain letters in the book that looked very innocent. And she would collect the books and bring them new ones. But the books would say, I am so-and-so of such and such a company and my parents live here. And then she would get word back to her parents, your son is safe and well. He's in a prison in camp, but he's alive. Wow. And so she was just very daring to pull off things right under the noses of, you know, the, the central headquarters for the Confederate military. Mm-hmm. In addition, she was hosting a lot of parties and getting the men liquored up, having the Confederate brass in, let the liquor flow, and their tongues would get loose. Loose and lips she would ships. Probably pre- yes. <laughs> and she would probably pretend like she just couldn't comprehend, yeah, you yeah. know, all that man talk. Yeah. <laughs> And she was passing the information (laughs) along, and her information was found to be so reliable, eventually it went straight to General Grant, who by that time was the commander-in-chief of the Union forces. Now, she was never found out, was she, or punished in any way? Mm, Well, she was not punished. She got away with it. I think they sort of thought Elizabeth was doing something. And in Richmond, she was called Crazy Bet, Bet short for Elizabeth, and they're not sure why. Either she put on an air of acting crazy to get a lot, get away with things, yes. or perhaps they just thought she was crazy because she was an abolitionist. Although my reading is that about half of Richmond was Union sympathizers. Um, mm-hmm. So she did have quite a network. She set up of people, of couriers, had uh, a number of ways they smuggled information out, like in, in the heels of boots that were muddy. You know, be sure you take the muddy route because nobody's going to want to go through your muddy boots to look... F- to inspect oh, it. Oh, smart. So Richmond itself was almost like a microcosm of the whole country at that time. About ha- You had both sides right there uh, really it's, living and working together while you're fighting each other. Uh, apparently. I'm, I'm not that good a historian wow. to know for sure. I, but I did read that Richmond was about half Union sympathizers. So she was able to put together a pretty good network. Well, she provides the the first soprano for you. There is a second soprano, equally amazing woman. There is. The second one is a woman named Mary and later was married and, and her name became Mary Bowser. And she was a former slave of Elizabeth's father. And she was one of the ones set free. Bet, Elizabeth, recognized that Mary was extremely intelligent and she arranged for her to go to Philadelphia to a Quaker school. It was called a Quaker school for the colored. And um, so I don't know the extent of the education, whether it was, you know, like basic grammar school. Mm -hmm. We do know she was literate. She could read and write. uh, Very rare at that time, right? No one would expect a a slave or an enslaved person to be reading or writing at that time. That's correct. Uh, So she had been educated. She returned to Richmond. She was working in Elizabeth's home, I imagine, as a paid free domestic servant. Um, But. Mary, besides being able to read and write, she also had a photographic memory. Wow. And you, you read a few people, their accounts of a few people that knew her said this was just amazing. She could pick up a piece of paper and very quickly have the entire paper memorized. And she could listen to lengthy conversations and repeat them later word for word. Mm. And so that's the story. Uh, um, Mary... Well, let's see. Should I jump ahead of myself here or not? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess so. It ended up that Mary was able to pose as a slave in Jefferson Davis's home. Yeah. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, his home served as the White House for the Confederacy, where she would be completely ignored as far as being a threat to military intelligence leak. You know, that you won't be able to read and write. Even if you could, you wouldn't understand what we're talking about. We will just talk like you're not even there. We won't even notice you. Well, And, if and I, she played into that. Yes. And, and if I remember correctly, um, 
it was almost that people who were serving other people were taught to pretend that they are invisible. And the, the aristocratic people were taught to just treat them as if they were invisible. So what a perfect place for a spy to be. Just act like you don't understand what's going on. You have access to everything. Well, you're dusting. You have access to every room, every square inch of every room while you're dusting the home. And what, but while she can be just absorbing all that information and passing it on, how did she pass it along? Where did she, if she wouldn't want to read or write, write anything in front of anybody. Well, um, the baker was in on this, the town baker. Wow. And uh, at least the one that made the deliveries to the Davis home. Mm -hmm. And he was part of the spy ring. And so she would go out to bring in the bread and she would pass the information on. We do know she had developed a coding system. But as you said, I'm not sure. She certainly wouldn't let anybody know that she could read and write. But Mm -hmm. she had some coding systems. And then I think I've read she also had a, a coding system of how she hung out the laundry to indicate when they needed to send the baker when she had some information. They had a brilliant thing going, didn't they? And did this go, did she get found and, out? And they ever? were both firebrands. I mean, yeah, they were. Yeah. this was daring. I mean, if she had been caught, hanging oh. would have probably been the kind fate. Yeah, wow. And um, no, she got away with it. She was in there for a year and a half. And then my understanding is she started realizing that they were catching on to her. They had realized there was a leak somewhere. They couldn't figure it out. And they were starting to get wise to her. And she realized it because she was smart. Mm -hmm. And so she left in the middle of the night one night. Wow. And on the way out, she tried to burn down the house. But that's the only thing she did that failed. It didn't burn down. But she she left. And then she made herself scarce. So um, after the war, we don't know much. She very purposely changed her name, disappeared into the woodwork. Uh, so she could remain anonymous. How do we know this much about her? Because it seems like she covered her tracks so very well. What is available to study? Very little. Um, There is an author named Lois Levine, who was a historian and wanted to write a biography. And so she researched it, and there wasn't enough to write a biography. So she wrote a work of historical fiction called The Secrets of Mary Bowser. Mm. And it's from Lois Levine that I borrowed uh, the title of my work, not not the title of her book, but I, uh, in doing my research, I um, ran across um, a YouTube interview, a, a television interview Lois Levine did on you know a local television art show, and she made this statement. I thought, oh, there is a title there. She said, "So Mary is playing on the stereotype that she is too ignorant to comprehend anything, Mm -hmm. when in fact she's absorbing it all. And so instead of being above suspicion, Mary is beneath suspicion. Love that phrase. And I thought, oh, that's a great title. So, and that's precisely what she was doing. She was, she was in because she was beneath suspicion. Mm. So good. We're speaking with Dr. Jesse Ayers from Malone University. He recently won first place in a a contest uh, looking for a new modern opera uh, that took place out in Wichita, Kansas, but he's from right here in our own hometown. Um, Jesse, we can go over in this first section if we have to, because I have to ask you this. Can you imagine the conversation between Elizabeth and Mary, where Elizabeth basically is saying, you're free. I am freeing you. In fact, I want to help educate you. But I've got an idea. Would you be willing to do this with me? Uh, That had to be a great sales job, very persuasive talk. I try to think of what that conversation sounded like. You wrote what it sounded like in singing. Uh, talk about that a little bit. I did. Do you need to do your breakfast? This might take a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what? We're going to leave it right there. Uh, talking with Jesse Ayers, remind us again the, the name of the actual award that you have just received. The 30th anniversary ZPIC Modern Opera Award from Opera Kansas in Wichita. Awesome. Well, we'll be back with Jesse after these words. You're listening to our community.